Hello, I'm Brian Hudson, founder of the Equal Parenting Alliance, and also one of the great many parents who've been through this broken system a number of times now. But I won't talk about my own circumstances. This is about helping you to help yourself with your own case. The bottom line is that parenting should be shared between both parents, unless, of course, there are immediately provable reasons for that not to be the case because that is what is best for our children. Unfortunately, the system is open to abuse and the abuse of the system and the abuse of our children as a direct result is now an absolute epidemic and a public health crisis. So before I start, here is a little disclaimer so that no one sues me. The guidance I'm giving you in this video is just guidance. I'm not qualified to give you advice as such, and you accept that any decisions you make are the result of considering this information and guidance in the light of your own circumstances. And you should also get your own legal advice, even though you probably can't afford to. Everything I share with you in this video is the result of my own extensive research advice that I've received from professionals in my own case, common sense, my inbuilt sense of child centricity and justice, witnessing firsthand what my own children have been through, being on the receiving end of quite appalling behavior, reading the case histories of many, many cases around the world, making some really bad choices of my own and then having to clean up the mess. I'm not a solicitor, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a social worker, so my voice is definitely not the be all and end all, but I hope you will take some useful insights from it and you will be able to, you'll be all the better prepared to navigate your own journey as a result. Okay, first of all, you're probably watching this video because you have had false allegations made against you as part of a separation or a family court process which has affected your contact with your children. These allegations will or already have hit you emotionally like a ton of bricks. You've been left stunned. It's taken your breath away. You've been deeply, deeply hurt that someone you once loved, maybe you even still do, who you believed loved you, could ever be capable of making these allegations and you'll be angry, for sure you will be angry, that's only natural and it's okay, but realize there is real danger in those moments of anger. And this is why you must stop, take a deep breath, do not react. Speak to the calmest person that you know, let their calm nature help to clear the red mist which can very easily surround you and consume you. Seriously, I say this because the worst thing that you can do is react. Do not do it. Fantasize by all means. Remember that your thoughts are pervasive and you will have unpleasant thoughts. You will feel like you can't control them at times and it's fine to have these thoughts. It doesn't mean you're losing your mind but do not act on them. They are all part of your journey. This will be one of your most difficult life journeys, but you will get through it. You can handle the pain because you are way stronger than you give yourself credit for. Reacting will make it all the more difficult and your child will suffer even more for every rash decision you might take that makes this more difficult. Trust me on this. Understand also that these allegations have been made by your ex in order to gain the upper hand, to control the situation and to intimidate you for their own personal advantage. Your ex will almost certainly have been advised to follow this strategy either by her legal advisors, although that will in all likelihood have been done in an off the record style or alternatively, alternatively, their friendship group will have dispensed the advice because they followed the same strategy to get what they wanted. 
and they probably succeeded. Expect your ex's lawyer to be thoroughly unreasonable, aggressive and intimidating. They will almost certainly live up to that expectation because their business model is dependent upon them fueling this dispute. For them, it's all about billable hours. They don't care about you and they don't care about your ex and they don't care about your children. This is purely about billable hours and they get more of those by intensifying the dispute and prolonging it. For this reason alone, but also to protect your integrity and your sanity, resist the temptation to be aggressive or to chuck rocks back when writing to your ex's lawyer. That's what they want you to do and they will provoke you to try to achieve exactly that. They are being paid to bully you. The longer your responses to their letters, the more they will charge your ex to read them and respond back to you with a lengthy letter of their own. And so the cycle continues. So just keep to the point because you may well end up paying your ex's legal fees and you won't win anything at all through these exchanges, whether they are heated or not. Try reading their letters three times over before you write a reply. Rewrite your reply at least three times before you send it. Make it shorter each time and ignore anything that isn't directly relevant to your children's care. But for each point they've made that isn't relevant, tell them it isn't. And that is why you are not entertaining it. The allegations against you will almost certainly be of a nature that gives your ex the justification they need to prevent you from having contact with your children and to have you removed from your home or make you too scared to return. For any of those allegations, there will need to be evidence. So you should sleep a little easier knowing that if there is no evidence, then the allegations cannot come to anything in terms of you being convicted. In all likelihood, your communications by email, text message, your diary entries and so on will help you to prove the falsehood of those allegations as well. Now, having said this, I'm not saying that you do nothing, definitely not, but you must follow the laid down processes and also understand that uh, I can't stress this highly enough, that the truth is your greatest friend. Your ex has committed themselves now to lying and they can't go back. Well, at least not without losing face and prejudicing their position. As soon as you cross the line with your own behaviour, it is very, very difficult, if not impossible, for you to go back to having the truth as your friend. That will make you just as bad as the other side and you will have lost the advantage that your ex handed to you when they made their false allegations and you will have given them all the ammunition they need to be able to portray you as the aggressor and that is exactly what they want. Remember their false allegations are as much to provoke reactions from you as they are to gain the immediate upper hand. If you can be provoked into a reaction which takes you across the behaviour line then you can forget all about the allegations that have been made because that reaction alone could wind up costing you your relationship with your child. The stakes are quite literally that high. So when I say don't react, here's my top 10 examples of what not to do in no particular order. Number one, do not call your ex and start shouting down the phone. There is every chance they are recording the call. Do not send abusive text messages or emails. They will keep those communications and use them against you. Do not go to where your ex is living or working and start shouting and screaming or making threats. Any of that type of behavior will wind up with you having a court order against you and then a mountain to climb. The mountain is already there, but it's Mount Snowden and you can navigate that. Do not turn into Mount Everest or a mission to Mars. Do not start airing your dirty laundry on social media. That will come back to haunt you and you could end up with a 
a bunch of legal cases against you for harassment, defamation, slander, and such like on top of the false allegations. And you need that right now, just like you need a hole in the head. This is particularly important if you are already in the court process and bound by confidentiality. You could even wind up being in contempt of court, which might seriously impact your case. Do not get into shouting matches with your ex when you see them or their relatives or their friends. There is every chance someone will be recording a video of that and that will be used um, and submitted as evidence to show you as an aggressor, adding weight to the allegations made against you, even though they are false and it is highly likely that any video footage will be edited to ensure that any provocation that happened leading up to you losing your temper doesn't appear in the video. This is even more important if your children are present. Do not rise to the bait. Do not badmouth your ex to staff at your children's school. That will be recorded and will harm your case. Remember that the school and the court are mandated to act in the children's interests only. Whilst they are caring people, the children rightly come first and they do not have time for and can't do anything about the dispute you're having with your ex. Try not to involve them in any of the adult stuff. Be a shining example of child focus and child centric parenting. Don't talk to your children about the court process and do not badmouth your ex within earshot of your children. That is harmful and it is parental alienation. Your ex is probably already alienating your children and it's harmful enough for one parent to be doing that. Do not lower yourself to that standard. It stinks and you are better than that. Do not simply throw back counter allegations against your ex for revenge. And certainly if they are not true or you have no proof. Without proof, there is little point making an allegation. If you have concerns that need to be recorded, then raise them as concerns in preference to allegations. Otherwise, you are just going to be tarred with the same brush as your ex. Do not go on a bender. Heavy drinking or taking drugs could easily lead to you making bad decisions. And the last thing you need now is to become dependent on any illicit substance. Please remember that you could very well be drug and alcohol tested in these proceedings. Do not allow yourself to be gripped by hatred. That toxic rubbish will eat you alive. It will lead to making bad decisions. It will sap you of energy. It will impact your friendships and your relationships. And it can even make you very ill. Let it go. Hatred has no place in the journey you are now embarking on and will absolutely lead to a worse outcome for you and everyone connected to you. So just let it go. So here are my top 13 examples of what you should do. Make sure you keep all communications, that's everything. Make sure your phone is being backed up to iCloud or the Android equivalent. Make sure your laptop and email and all other devices you have. Any communications or evidence on are backed up. If you lose your phone or it's stolen or you drop it down the toilet, that loss could cost you your case. This is so important, sort it out right after you finish watching this video. Write to your ex about seeing your children and make proposals for contact starting immediately. If they insist that contact has to be supervised, then ask them to clearly state their reasons why it must be supervised. If you are told that it's due to safety concerns or vague answers of that type, that's not good enough. Write to them again, and give them a week to give you specifics as to what their safety concerns are, what solutions they propose to alleviating their concerns. If you receive an answer, but it doesn't have solutions or their solutions are unworkable, then make your own proposal as to how those concerns can be alleviated. Always do this to show that you are solution focused. For every problem you are presented with, offer a sensible remedial solution and make sure you are keeping copies of what you send. Record all phone calls. Do not tell your ex 
that you are recording as they will simply refuse to speak to you. You will have to accept that you can't use those recordings in court. However, if it comes to proving that your children are at risk of harm and those recordings do provide proof, then you may be able to have them admitted as evidence. If things are said in those phone calls which concern you, then you can put those concerns on the record in writing. For example, email your ex to say something along the lines of, I'm very concerned that you said X, Y, and Z in our phone call earlier today. You probably won't get a reply, but that doesn't matter. It's on the record and you can include these communications in your evidence. And the recordings will also be useful in terms of keeping a journal. If you're having Skype contact with your children, be sure that you record it rather than using the Skype app to record because that notifies the other side. Point your phone at the computer screen and record your record on your phone or other video device. This will protect you from further false allegations. Do not delete your Skype history. It may prove to be a useful form of evidence. If your children are being alienated from you, make a subject access request for their school to send you a copy of the contents of the child protection folder for each of your children. Do this every few months and in good time for any hearing where you are submitting statements and evidence. This folder may have reports of concern completed by the staff, which you will be otherwise completely unaware of and they may well be really helpful for your case. School staff are very good at spotting parental alienation and they record these things. It is also common practice for certain unscrupulous legal advisors to encourage their client to manipulate the contents of this folder in order to gain entries to it, which they hope will help their case. Thankfully, school staff are often wise to this and the strategy can backfire, therefore helping your case. Either way, you need to be ensuring that you're aware of the contents of this folder and that your ex knows you are gaining access to it. If your children's behavior is being affected by alienation, that will manifest at school and inevitably incidents will be recorded which show the impact of their behavior and emotional well-being and the alienation that they're being exposed to. Every couple of months or so, ask for your children's, att children's attendance record and the incident log. If you suspect your ex is misinforming the school about your involvement with your children, or they are trying to manipulate the school, ask the school to send you a copy of all communications between them and your ex. They might refuse this on data protection grounds. If so, ask the court to make a direction for disclosure. If the court agrees, the disclosure will be both sides. So your communications go to your ex. This means it's really important to keep any communications with the school factual, polite, calm and child focused because your communications will very likely be shared with your ex and the court at some point. Make sure you get a copy of all outgoing communications from the school no matter what the subject is. Make sure you attend every meeting, every consultation or event at the school unless you're prohibited by the court from doing so. Well, in advance of your court hearing, before you write your statement, get a copy of your child's medical records from your GP. They will print this off for you the same day and can't refuse you. You may find that your ex has had the GP add notes about domestic violence to your child's medical notes, intending to present this to the court as part of their case building. So it's essential that you are aware of this so that you can cut off that attempt to manipulate the process. If there are notes added of this nature, make sure you write to the manager of the surgery stating that the reported events are denied and merely the result of acrimony through lit litigation. Request that this letter is filed on your children's medical records. Send a copy of the letter to your ex so that they are aware you have rumbled their case building. Make sure the letter is polite, concise and factual. Do not go into lengthy explanations of your case. Hopefully that will put a stop to any more of that type of case building. Do get regular exercise. It will help you enormously to cope with the stress of not seeing your children and the court process. And you simply must give yourself a healthy physical outlet. Do try to eat well 
and look after yourself, even though you won't feel like doing that. Force yourself and be disciplined. Do lean on your friends and your family for support and get counselling if you can. Don't fear that engaging with counselling can be used against you. It will only be seen as you being proactive to support your own mental health in a time of crisis. And that is an entirely responsible and healthy thing to do. If you find yourself with time on your hands, think about volunteering. This will help you to keep you help to keep you busy so that you're not festering and staring too deeply into your own belly button. It will also give you a chance to reset your perspectives, particularly if you volunteer to help people who are having a really hard time. You will also attract much needed positive energy into your life and feel better for the sense of purpose it will give you. Often one of the most difficult things to deal with after separation or losing access to your children is a sense of losing purpose. Volunteering can really help you to fill that gap. So back to these allegations, I've said not to react, but I am not saying do nothing, not by a long shot. The first thing you do is make a formal application to the court for contact with your children. Do not wait, submit this application the same day that your contact is stopped and do not let the false allegations or a solicitor advising you to take it slower lead you to delaying making that application. You don't have to use a lawyer to complete the application. They aren't that difficult, but you must make the application to get the process started. And if you wait, that wait will not only lengthen your battle, it will probably be used against you with an inference that you didn't apply because you don't care about your children. Manage your expectations. That application will not get a hearing for at least six weeks, unless you have evidence that the children are being harmed and at risk, in which case you can apply for an emergency hearing and that can result in a hearing within just a few days. Use the time delay wisely. Write to your ex in a calm manner. Do that. Do all that you can to resolve your dispute without going to court, but not simply by giving in to all their unreasonable demands. Make every attempt to have contact with your child between now and your court hearing. It's very likely that your ex will either not reply or will be abusive in their reply or simply point blank refuse your requests in curt responses. No matter what the response is, it is important that you are making these efforts and that you keep them polite to the point and with a tone that is reconciliatory rather than inflammatory. These communications may form part of your case if or when you go to court and equally if they are abusive, then they will be used against you in evidence. If there is anything at all in your communications, with your ex, which you do not want to be referenced um, to the court, then you must ensure that you write the words without prejudice in bold capitals at the top of your communication. In legal matters, this means that your communication won't be read or considered by a judge unless it is clear that the content of this, of this is material importance to the safety of your children. So the allegations in all likelihood will be one or more of the following and perhaps many varying examples of each. Rape or sexual assault, domestic violence against your ex, violence against one or more of your children, abusive behaviour towards your children, neglect of your children, attempted murder, some form of sexual abuse of your children, abuse of drink or drugs. There will be Plenty more than the list that I've just reeled off, no doubt, but it will help you to realise that the court will only be concerned about anything that is relevant in terms of whether it affects the safety of the children and your ability to parent them. That said, there will probably be a report made to the police by your ex as part of an obvious effort to add weight to their allegations. And if those allegations about events claimed to have happened sometime before your separation, then they can only be retrospective reports and therefore the question will be raised as to why no complaint to the police was made at the time. However, there is a possibility that you will be arrested. 
If your ex files a report that you have sexually assaulted them, for example, the police are duty bound to pursue that accusation provided your ex is fully cooperative with the investigation. They may well lose their nerve at that stage or their lawyer advises them to back off at that stage. This will likely lead at the very least to a phone call from the police. You may be required to attend the police station and you may be arrested so that they can interview you. If you are arrested, assuming that this is a false allegation, your ex has crossed the line and can be prosecuted for wasting police time and for malicious prosecution. If it goes to court and you are proven to be innocent, your ex will have committed perjury. The consequences of that in criminal proceedings can be significant term in prison. If you are able to prove very quickly that the allegation you've been arrested for is false, then they will take no further action, which will be you'll be able to show in family court hearing when the time comes. If the police do not contact you, then you can safely assume that they have decided that no further action is required. And that is, of course, also a good thing. You can ask the police to treat any further reports uh, being made to them by your ex as harassment. If you do this, then any officer that attends a call out as a result of a report made by your ex will have to investigate the event as possible harassment, which could result in your ex being prosecuted or at the very least receiving a caution. And again, this will be useful for you in your case and also hopefully getting your ex to start regulating their own behavior because if they have a modest level of intelligence, they will begin to realize that you are no fool and the eyes are well and truly on them. So I hope this first self-help video will be useful for you. I'll be posting more on a variety of family court relevant topics in a week on a weekly basis. Ultimately, the law needs to change so that these state sponsored crimes against children and against parents can no longer happen. Or at least when they do, there are severe enough deterrents to put off repeat offending. At the moment, as you well know, there really is no deterrent. Your strength is very much needed to be part of that fight. So please click the link below to visit the Equal Parenting Alliance Facebook page. Complete the survey to help us gather as much statistical data as possible to back up the campaign. There's a link in the comments below. Then like, share and follow the Facebook page and do whatever you can to help us achieve the change in the law. 50-50 assumption of care at separation is just one of the objectives. There are a number of other issues that need to be fought for in tandem with this effort as well. So we have targeted action on all those two. The action plan for how all of us will come together to get the change in the law that's required will be announced on Father's Day, Sunday 16th June this year at noon by a Facebook Live broadcast. Follow the page so that we can keep you informed of developments. There are millions of us affected by this, not just the parents, it's also the grandparents, the older siblings and step-siblings, the new partners supporting the alienated parent, the uncles and aunts, the supportive close friends, the work colleagues, the teaching staff at school who cope with the effects day in and day out. All of us will come together and we've all got your back. So remember, stay calm, stay focused, keep to the truth. There will be setbacks, but you only fail when you give up. Do not give up. You've got this. Over and out.